Competitive 40K Network presents Art of War. Art of War. Strategy and tactics. Discussions with the best players on the planet. On the planet. With your host, Paul Murphy, and expert coach, Nick Nanavati. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Art of War podcast. Another year. How's it going, Matt? Oh, excellent, mate. I'm uh, gearing right up for the you know, the end of season majors and just uh, looking yonder to uh, to future state 40K. It's an exciting time to be uh, to be a 40K player. Absolutely. So as you may have noticed, this is Matt Morisoli. Uh, we're still not joined with our normal co-host, Paul Murphy. Still allowing it off in Disneyland. What an awesome place he's having. But I got Matt Morisoli here, one of our very own Art of War coaches, very accomplished Warhammer player, WTC member of Team Australia, who won this past year. Uh, on to talk about um, kind of the new world of 40K that we're experiencing, and then hopefully in part two, uh, this is of course a two-part show, in part two we're going to cover lists and all that. So in part one, we're going to talk about all these new changes and what we think the game's going to be about, and in part two, we're going to build lists in this new world and really try to take our new steps in the unseen meta. Yeah, very uh, very exciting, right? Because whenever you have, you know, even just like a balanced data slate in isolation, things kind of get shaken up. But when you know, the stars align and you get a data slate and points adjustments and mission pack changes, the game kind of becomes the Wild West for a couple of weeks and everyone's figuring new stuff out. And uh, it's all really, really exciting when um, when that sort of aligns like that. Sometimes it doesn't end up as great as other times. You know, there have been metas that have been less fun to play in than others. But I really love this sort of, you know, this sort of month-long period of just figuring stuff out and seeing what used to be bad but is now good and sort of vice versa. Yeah, I think this this is a really fun time for the game. I love also that they're releasing all the changes at once because just a portion of it really does feel incomplete. Some problems yeah. in the game need rules changes and some just need points adjustments. Yeah, absolutely, man. Like, I think there's there's been plenty of, uh, plenty of times you can look back into the past and see that things got nerfed, but then they got buffed three months later or two months later and, you know, you get left in limbo. And it actually, it, it's more of a, you know, it's more of an initial shock now, right? Because so many things change at once. But when you change things three times over three months because they stagger, you know, the mission pack, then the balance data slate, and then the points, it's actually harder to adapt to that meta because things are changing like three times, right? So here we get it all out of the way in one go. You know, some of these changes are really good. Some of them, you know, I'm not as much of a fan of, and I don't like everything that's been done here, but I think we're going to get this, like, this shock now of everything changing. And then in a month's time, everyone will have adapted and will be in that, I guess, new meta phase, which I think is more healthy. I think it, it, this is a healthier way to do it than to stagger those releases, you know, over the course of a couple of months. Yeah, I completely agree. And also, it really resets and refreshes the game. So, like, especially you and I leading up to LVO, and hopefully we'll know one way or the other if they're going to use these changes or not. I personally hope they do. Uh, just to freshen it up, but it's really exciting to to basically have an unknown meta leading up to the world finale. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Like it's um, it, it's cool. Again, I, I I would like to play old rules, but I've come around to the new rules very quickly. Like I was initially thinking to myself, I really don't want to play this kind of you know, like I said, Wild West meta where we don't know what's going to come and what's going to be you know what's going to be good and what's going to be bad, and we we don't really know what the you know the best players are going to cook up. But at the same time, you know, Nephilim is. You know, is kind of like it's six months old. Right, we've played these missions for a long time, and a lot of the new missions are very similar. And we'll probably touch on that a little bit later on. Like the actual gameplay is similar, but I think the mission changes themselves are almost all positive. The actual like the actual mission pack, I think, is almost all positive. And it's really just going to be list building. Like I think list building is where the game is going to get broken open. And I actually really like seeing this because I think we're going to see some really cool stuff go. You know, go five and one, go six and zero oh at LVO. Like I think there's going to be something totally out there that no one else spots that's going to make the top eight, and that's fun. It's exciting to not think well, it's going to be you know three thousand Suns players and two Demon players and a Votan player, and you know it's not going to just be what we think it's going to be with those preconceived notions going into the tournament. Yeah, absolutely. Just the the fact that it's so unexplored is what I think it really refreshes me about it. Just to cover some of those changes, though, we got an Arcs of Omen mission set, which, like you said. Uh, really tweaks and changes the missions. They're largely the same, though. Any big changes that stuck out to you, Matt? No, look, I, I think the two um, the two missions that had the CP changes, the one where if your warlord dies, you don't get CP, and the one where if you're not in no man's land, you don't get CP, just moving those to four-ups, I think, is a really healthy thing to do as well. Um, 
Knight players hated going second, getting their Warlord Knight shot off the board and not getting CP for the whole game. It was really, really terrible. Like, that was a really feel-bad moment. And like that going to a four-up, like sure, it still hurts, right? You're still getting half as much CP, but I think that's a pretty good you know, a pretty good change there on the mission front. And in terms of secondaries, I think with the, the changes to the way they've let you regen some CP by playing mission secondaries, I also think opens up some interesting tactical ideas where if you're playing an army that's more CP intensive, you can pick secondaries uh, like grind, like um, uh, like behind enemy lines, and try and like regen CP that way, so you can fund other things in the army. So I think those changes are really interesting too. Obviously, they needed to give some incentive to play uh, with troops for the armies that don't have good troops, given the I guess uh, more open world way of building armies now, right? So I think those those changes are pretty good. And then there are a bunch of secondary changes that are you know again it's probably too hard to cover every single one of those today, but a lot of those feel like they've balanced the game pretty well. I think the Necrons and and sisters getting slight nerfs uh, has been helpful, and I think the uh, you know some of the other armies like GSC getting slight buffs to their secondaries. You know, I, I think it's 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 a pretty good little balancing mechanism just to make the armies a little bit more playable. Yeah, I'm totally with that. And if you want a full breakdown of all the different changes, all to the rules, we're going to do one on YouTube. And Adam on Camilleri on Art of War Down Under uh, is also doing a full breakdown on his show, so you can check that out. It's part of our competitive 40k podcast. So to to the changes, I guess we have Arcs of Omen. Uh, the detachment that's the big elephant in the room that's kind of like you said list building is going to be opened wide up and that's really where the changes come into play like secondaries got nicer for some factions nerf for others um but there's the the real big thing here is that the points all got adjusted the balance data slate came out and how we build armies is different fundamentally you have one detachment it's the arcs of Omen detachment you got one hq you pick any compulsory slot you want so if you want to take as if you want to fill your army with elites as the true as the core choice or troops, or fast, or heavy, that's totally up to you. Take three of those, and that's your min. You're done. From there, you can take pretty much whatever you want after that. Zero to six of any slot. Zero to 12 troops if you start with troops. You can do whatever with that. Yeah, uh, it's... Look, in 90% of cases, it is just more CP, right? In 90% of cases, you're just playing, if you needed more of a slot before, you had to take a second detachment. Now you just don't have to do that. So most of the time, you're just playing with two or three more CP. Um, for some armies, it is a nerf. There are certain armies that want certain detachments or, you know, they, they want to take, you know, a sub-detachment. Like I've been playing a lot of Chaos Demons and I can't have a, a warp corn patrol for a warp storm, uh, for the corn warp storm anymore. And that feels really bad. And armies like Dark Angels can't have have um you know a uh a, a outrider vanguard whichever one of the fast attack one is i always forget which one the the elite and the fast attack ones are but they can't take one of those dracari can't take triple patrol there's a few things like that i know gw have said they're looking at um some uh some adjustments to fix the dracari and the uh the dark angel problem specifically but most of the time it just means you're going to have more cp and you're not going to be forced to take troops if you don't want to those are kind of the big takeaways you know at least for me i think there are some armies that don't really want to take you know a whole lot of troops like you know marines have just had some pretty big points decreases, and I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit later on as well. But the troops are traditionally pretty pretty average in the Space Marine Army, so they can just take one unit of infiltrators now if they want to, and then stock up on Terminators and Aggressors and Vets and whatever else they choose to take without being forced to spend you know, 300 odd points on troops. So really it's just more CP and it's less troops if your troops aren't very good. Um, and for some armies, that'll be a, you know, a really big buff. I couldn't agree more. I think for the majority of factions, it's exactly that, just more CP. Now you don't have to spend troop slot point, points on troop slots if you didn't want to. Um, you still, there's still actually reasons in a lot of factions to run troops. I know they're not compulsory, but they are obsec and they're often your cheapest units. So screening is a thing. Mm -hmm. um, actions are cheap. But uh, largely speaking, this just creates freedom. I know my Elder Army always wants at least two detachments because I, I need more than two to three HQ slots a lot of times. Now I can just get four. Sucks because I'm limited to four. If I wanted five in, in some armies, you definitely want those higher number of HQ slots. You do limit yourself there. But at least they have some workarounds for like the elite characters and things like that. And the one yeah, and, and like and armies like Harlequins that you know wanted more troops, they wanted more than six most of the time. Now just stick it in one detachment and save some CP too, right? So you know there are definitely pros and cons. There are winners and losers here. It's not just everyone gets something for free. Um, you know armies like uh, Gene Steel Occult, for example, can only take one of each character now because they're limited to one detachment. So like there are there are definitely winners and losers. It's not like it's a a free for all. Go and play whatever you want to play, but. 
for the vast majority of armies, like I said, it's it's more CP and it's just a little bit more um, a little bit more freedom in how you build your list. But even you know, there's there's a lot of other changes too that really, when you add them all together, make an entirely new meta. And what, what I'm really getting at here is no more armor of content. You know, space marines are just back to being killed. Death guard. They, they put their are points adjustments everywhere, which we're going to get to. But no more armor content on anything except leagues of Oten. They still got their version. Yeah, I just finished recording uh, Art of War Down Under with Adam, uh, as we mentioned earlier. I, I did the Balanced Data Slate episode with him. I uh, recorded that a couple of days ago, and this was probably the biggest change in the Data Slate itself. There's a whole bunch of them, and when that comes out, you know, Adam and I do a full breakdown of just what's in the Balanced Data Slate. Um, no armor of contempt is really big. It, it it really changes the math on a lot of weapons. Uh, AP one and two uh, goes up in stock pretty significantly. Um, you know, there are some there are some workarounds for marine players with with free war gear and things like storm shields being free on a lot of units. Not every unit, but a lot of units, so they can still get the plus one to their armor save and sort of like it, that's like armor of contempt never goes away for them. But AP two specifically, uh, you know, you go from being effectively AP one to being a true AP two, and in a lot of situations that actually doubles the failed number of um, of saves a unit will take. There's a a really good article on Reddit. I can't remember what the the um the author's name was, but there's a really good Math Hammer article on Reddit going through uh, essentially what Armor of Contempt does and the effect of it going away and how much damage increase it is. But taking a model from a two up save to a three up save is, is like is a hundred percent damage increase, right? There's a hundred percent more failed damage rolls there, and going from a you know a three up to a four up, it's a you know it's a fifty percent more. Like, you know, there are there are fifty percent more failed results coming out of the pool. So. AP one and AP two weapons are the biggest sort of you know I get I guess winners out of this. If you play an army that has a lot of AP one, a lot of AP two, I'm thinking things like um, Eldar with shuriken cannons and you know not getting the Ren, so like getting more value out of the AP one shots. I'm thinking you know things similarly like Harlequins, um, you know some of the AP one. Uh, AP2 combat weapons there as well. These weapons go up in value quite a lot. So where you might have had issues before, you know, taking those sort of weapons and those sort of profiles and feeling like you bounced off Marines, you're going to do a lot more damage now. I couldn't agree more. I think really Armor of Contempt was unhealthy for the game. A lot of players I know would agree with this because it, it created this AP arms race where if you weren't at least AP3, you really, you had the issue of bad into Armor of Contempt factions. So you can still saw some AP2. Really, you didn't see any AP1, AP0 unless it was on like a very specific specific unit like swooping hawks but uh that it invalidated so many factions and the older ones who you know just aren't designed for the armor of contempt world have like ap1 and ap2 everywhere at, at most they really really just fell out of place so i love to see that change erased as well just to make the game more accessible but of course you can't just take away armor of contempt without giving the marines that were already struggling something back now what'd they give them uh very significant points increases i think you'll agree <laughs> sorry, decreases. You. sorry decreases decreases is what i meant i said increases uh, <laughs> i meant decreases spent the entire day just just brainstorm bashing space marines together i mean like they're like my army would have been 3500 points last week oh my god uh, I don't think any of them were quite that way. Were they really 3,500? The most I got off was like 2,800, I think. I'm sure that was a bit of hyperbole, but they were uh, also saying yeah. that the Death Watch armies is not <laughs> yeah. that far off. No, no. Um, yeah, Death Watch, uh, definitely very well placed, I think. <laughs> I think there's um, there, there are quite a few very good Death Watch armies that we're going to see popping up. Uh, over the next couple of weeks, I'm horrified of the um, the Terminators that went down 50% uh, in that army. The Terminator with the Thunderhammer Storm Shield and the Cyclone Missile Launcher that is now literally, what is it, 30 points cheaper. Um, so not, not not all of the war gear costs are gone. Things like Vanguard Vets still pay for a lot of them. There are certain weapons that you still pay for, things like Thunderhammers pretty much universally. Um but there are sweeping points changes, not just to the units themselves, but in most instances, uh, instances removing war gear costs. Now, I, re- I really don't like this personally. I, I think this is what we saw with um, with Battle Company five odd years ago, whatever it was, when everything was free. Sure, it's not quite as extreme. There are no free transports this time. Um, but when this happens, like silly things tend to come out, right? This is, this is one of those ways where like, you know, th- there's no reason why a Terminator should pay the same number of points for a Power Fist as a Thunder Hammer. It doesn't really make sense to me. There's no real reason why, you know, you should pay the same points for a Power Fist as you pay for a, a, um, a Power Sword, right? Like, I think that, you know, they could have done with making the units base a little bit cheaper than they've already done, but still pricing the upgrades personally. Because I, I just think there's obviously going to be a clear like min-max winner in pretty much every unit as to what the most efficient loadout is going to be, right? Like you're never going to take a Bolter Inceptor. 
like plasma interceptor cost to save, you're never going to take a bolter interceptor. If, if I had um, to take a guess at it, and I, I totally agree with you. I think there's like a in almost every case there's going to be a mathematical. This is the best option for, for the job. I'm just going to take this one times five for my space marine unit. And in competitive 40k and how you and I view the game, like 100, percent that's what we're going to do. But I think like uh, from a Games Workshop brain perspective, if I could try to put myself in their shoes, the Space Marines are their beginner faction. They want this army as easily as accessible and playable as possible. So having 20 pages of of war gear options for every single unit, that's daunting too. So maybe this is far too extreme, but at least you you pick your unit and now I have whatever models. And I'm sure a Billy with his Space Marines has a power sword guy with a storm bolter and then one plasma cannon devastator and the other guy's got a multi melta and you know, et cetera. So for him, it's just like my unit costs this much. Yeah. It's easy to math for us. It's like, let me take as many plasma cannons or thunder hammers or whatever as I can possibly get. Yeah. Look, I, I, I understand that point of view, right. But I really think that's why power level exists. I really think that's why that way of playing the game exists um yeah fair point for that for sure forgot um, power level was a thing wow. yeah <laughs> most people do right like right. It, it, it almost never comes up but yeah look uh I, I, again like i said I, I don't like it i think that this will give marines table time and people will go and they'll win gts with marines with this rule set and look clearly clearly gw wants to do what they said they're going to nerf the top two factions and um buff the sorry uh, yeah yeah but buff the bottom two factions and nerf the top two factions based on win rates they've done that you know marines have been buffed admech have been buffed harlequins and tyranids have been you know pretty severely hurt uh i i just think this is the wrong way to do it i i, I just think that giving everything free war gear is the wrong way to do it well, giving I definitely think virtually like everything yeah very aggressive there's no way you can properly uh, i don't know the play test processes but i doubt you properly play tested every iteration of free space marine points and, and made sure if they made sense i think they're they're trying stuff and seeing what sticks with it so hopefully it doesn't mess up too badly yeah well <laughs> all i know is that from very limited testing and i'm not a space marine player by any stretch i really don't like space marines um but with limited testing, I found multiple lists that I think were good enough to go like five and one, six and zero oh at LVO almost immediately. I think um, there's just there's a lot of silly stuff, right? Like when you start looking at units that used to cost 400 points that now cost 350. When you look at things like Death Watch vet units that have gone down like almost 200 points each, you get a lot of stuff. Um, and I think that you know, there's going to be a lot of marine lists that were you know 2,500 odd points you know down at 2k that are just going to have enough stuff to sort of overwhelm a lot of players. Well, this is really we're getting into the meat of what I want to talk about in this podcast. You and I are in the same boat here. We're both considering demons for LVO. Demons got a couple lateral changes. You know, flamers got nerfed. They have to roll their hit now. Um, the flesh hounds came down a lot. Some other stuff came down, and you know, the game as a whole changed immensely. Like, Arcs of Omen's attachment is slightly different. You start with more CP. Balance data slate changes, points changes. Tyranids got kneecapped. Harlequins got knocked down a peg. Space Marines went up 20 tiers. The game's kind of all over the place. I want to take this episode and really map out the meta with you, Matt. What do you think people are going to be running at LVO? What are you prepared? For, what are you preparing yourself to play against? And what are you considering, Brain? Yeah, so I think that you could break this down into like two things, right? Because there's like there's Marines and there's all the sub variants of Marines and then there's everything else, right? So um, already from what I've sort of played around with Marines, I think Death Watch are the, they seem like the clear winner just based on the amount of free stuff they get they didn't get before. They seem like the, the, the clear winner in just terms of my units went down the most points. Doesn't mean they're the best, but it means that their units went down you know, probably the most points out of anything. So I think you have to be ready for Death Watch. Um, I think that their their secondary got buffed as well. Like you now pick the um, the battlefield roles you have to um, eliminate to score five points per, per battlefield role. So like you get to choose if your opponent has that one fast attack unit, you know, or the the one flyer. You just get to say, well, I just get to kill this one unit for five points. So Death Watch have definitely been buffed, you know, pretty significantly. Outside of that, I've written both Salamander and Blood Angel lists that I think are really good. Um, the fact that uh, aggressors are down now to 30 points as well means you can run things like, you know, 30 Thunder Hammer Storm Shield Terminators and 18 aggressors and just combat squad everything and have all of these units, you play them as a successor with plus one to hit and um, with exploding sixes. And you can just rocket these units into your opponent. Um, and you don't really care if they die because the aggressor units are worth 90 points each and the Terminator units are worth 160. And it just, it feels like you're not giving away very much, but you're throwing damage on damage on damage you know, at your opponent 
repeatedly. And then you've got things like the plus two um, to charge Litany uh, Chaplain, who can make the Terminators have seven inch charges from Deep Strike. So there's a whole lot of stuff, like just like really aggressive lists that leverage things like you know, just mass Terminators, I think is going to be a thing as well. And then there's the shooting Marines. Then there's things like, you know, uh, like Iron Hands. I know that Innes has been talking about lists with the Gladiator Reaper that went down pretty significantly as well. Yeah, um, John and no. John, not to interject, but John and Jack were also on the permanent Devastator Doctrine. You take like three Gladiators, three mm-hmm. Landspeeder, uh, the, the tank version of Landspeeder Storm, I think it was called. Um, a few Landspeeder vehicles, three Invictor Warsuits, and you just shoot people in Dev Doctrine. That, yep. that Super Contemptor Dread with the Volkites is still there. Mm-hmm. Uh, shoots. It's okay, Nick. We're playing demons. We don't have armor saves. They can't have any negatives on our armor saves. It's fine. That's we're, we're, Imperial we're, we're okay. Fists, we didn't even notice yeah. their doctrine. Didn't even change. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a- a- absolutely right. So, like, then there's then there's the whole thing with, like, the, the, the tools required to beat shooting Marines are very different to the tools required to beat combat Marines. Um, and that's where I think the issue is. Because Death Watch kind of do both. It's not quite the same level of shooting or the same level of combat as... You know, as Blood Angels or as Iron Hands, but they kind of do both. Um, and then there are the extremes on either end where you can run mass terminators and aggressors, or you know, still sa- like Sangard is still good, and you know, and Death Company is still good, right? Like everything in that Blood Angels army was already competing before, um, and now it's just had points drops and a bunch of things. And then, yeah, other side of this is just the mass shooting, right? With all the the gladiators and the land speeders and the devastators that can have you know free last cannons because why not? Um, and yeah, like Marines is a whole, I, I the spectrum of what's going to be good is going to be pretty vast. Um, and that's going to make it really difficult to, to deal with. Well, I like the way you broke it down in the beginning. You said there's two ways to, to approach this. There's the half that is space Marines widely changed and they have a whole new array of archetypes to explore. And then there's the rest of the game. So you break down space Marines, there's the hyper shooting armies that, and there's the hyper combat armies. Combat armies are made of like Terminators and MSU and aggressors and MSU and just so many small squads that trade up effectively. Shooting armies are made of dead doctor and permanently and divide by vehicles. Um, there's other flavors to them, and I'm sure there's there's ways to fine tune those lists. But in a in a quick rush through kind of sense, what do you think is going to come out for the rest of the field? You know, how, what other armies do you think are good besides Space Marines? So because Space Marines are the clear winner, right? I think. After the first couple of rounds, you know, if we think about, you know, the the chance of playing someone more casual who's just there for fun is much higher in the first couple of rounds because typically the more competitive players will beat those players, right? So I think once you get through those first couple of rounds, you're going to be left with the Marine players and the players who are teched to beat Marines. So Marines are going to be so meta-defining here that they're going to define the meta not only in that Marines are, you know, one of the best lists within the meta, but you're also going to have all these people building lists that specifically beat Marines. So you have to not only beat both variants of Marines, but you have to beat the things that beat Marines, <laughs> which is uh, which is a bit insane. That's that's what I said. My last LVO was 2020, and that's what it was like then. It was everyone playing Space Marines. It was the uh, the Breviathan year. Um, it was the what was it? The, the Iron Hands Dread with character and all that stuff. And it was people playing Marines and people playing stuff that beats beats Space Marines. So I think. Um, I think Harlequins are going to go away. I, I just think the, the nerfs to Harlequins are so significant they're going to go away. They were okay into Space Marines with a lot of shooting that was too damaged, but I think they just get outshot now. But what I think we're going to see is Tau, very specifically. Tau can shoot uh, and kill a lot of Space Marine bodies. Um, I'm not sure what Mr. Siegler is cooking up, but I'm sure he has Tau lists that can absolutely blast Space Marines. Yeah, I mean, Tau, Tau are made of weapons that you stick like three of them on a Crisis model and like six Space Marines die when, when they fire, so... Absolutely on that front. I think Eldar also got a lot better. Yep. Like you yep. said earlier, their shuriken weapons, the, the AP1 spam that they do, the AP0 spam they do, that only gets better with lack of armor or contempt. And they are made of marine killing weapon profiles if they want to be. They're also very yep. hard for marines to interact with if you're doing the fire and fades and stuff effectively. Yeah, well, that's one of the biggest things Adam and I spoke about on the, the Balanced Data Slate episode was the return of infinite fire and fade for Craftworld Eldar. So the fact that you can fire and fade every turn again uh, is a massive deal for armies like that, especially on the LVO terrain where you've got, you know, big, like count the bottom floor as one of sight blocking big ruins to be able to move out and shoot things and then hide effectively, you know, every turn. Um, you know, Space Marines don't really like that. So definitely agree. Eldar, uh, you know, are going to be up in the mix. Um, Votan, similarly, they've got a lot of ranged weapons that kill Marines pretty well. I think Votan will struggle into 
the shootier marine list. I think Votan will struggle into like the Iron Hands and the Imperial Fist. They'll they'll do pretty well under the Blood Angels and like the Sallies, I think. Really? I always um, figured Votan would just outshoot a Space Marine army. Do you think the points decreases are just so insurmountable? And Votan also got nerfed a little bit on points too. But yeah, they did, man. But uh I, I think that look, look, I, I think they'll they'll get shot and die when there's so much like so much stuff in that marine army, right? Like when you've got you know, three gladiators and devastator squads and dreads and just like I, I just think that the shooting marines kill them. Honestly, I, I just think the shooting marines get like they they just chunk through them, and the units are so inexpensive that I think the firefight goes in the marines' favor. Look, I, I could be wrong, right? I, I could be I could be it's wrong. It's all like, conjecture, like, right? No one's put this on the table yeah. yet. Yeah, I, I could be wrong. I, I, I think that firefight goes in their favor, but I also think like um you know you know like the, the, there's. The way they interact with the melee marines, I think, is very different to the way they interact with the shooting marines, if that makes sense. So I just, I think the games are very different. Um, so I guess, let me let me bring it back a step. We're kind of saying space marines are now meta-defined. They went from zeros to heroes, mm-hmm. despite losing armor and content. And the way they do it is through sheer volume of, of pick-efficient units here. So in my brain, the way you've always fought space marines when they're, when they're just too cheap is to load your army up with anti-marine type weaponry, like strength, four plus five really like strength six and onward because they have toughness four toughness five a lot and then ap at least two and three ap2 is good and mass ap3 is even better two damage go home call it a day just shoot people all day long three damage if you think they're packing terminators yeah well it, it, i don't think that changes right like they're easier to kill now uh, right, there's, just more, there's just more of them <laughs> like is, is the, are they like i understand conceptually they have free weapons and i think that's actually kind of mandatory because the, the the marine body especially without armor condemned is just not durable in today's day and age so yeah. you, no one was paying like let me load up the the 40 points of war gear on my space marine veteran oh he got shot by anything and died now it's still gonna get shot by anything and die he's just really really destructive before he goes out compared to before yeah like i don't think the way you play into it changes almost at all i just think you need to be more efficient so like before look here's a really good example right i was playing drakari when armor of contempt came into the game so before armor of contempt i was playing drakari this is when like stubborn defiance dark angels were a thing and they were really tough they were really hard to kill but like drakari was still getting through that army right like i was still killing everything in that army just because everything has ap my units are cheap you know i punch through them i fight them and i kill them um, just with volume of AP1, AP2, and then things like Incubi and stuff like that as well. Armor of Contempt comes in, and all of a sudden the damage on Witches and Racks just drops, just drops off the face of the earth, right? Like your your damage is just so much you know, less. Like I said earlier, right, you know, the difference between a 2-up and a 3-up save is 100%. Like there's 100% more failed results on a 3-plus than on a 2-plus. You know, you're literally killing twice as many models with that change. So... I think the volume, even, even if you're not taking those weapons, even if you're not taking mass strength six AP two two damage, which is like a pretty good profile into you know into a space marine body, right? Even like mass strength four strength five AP two one damage, like you know extra volume of weapons like that, I think they go up in in stock you know, really significantly as well. Um, the the key thing for me, I think, is just having more units on the board now that I can trade with the marine army because. In my opinion, most of them just don't have very good secondaries. Like, you know, um, you know, Shock Tactics is a pretty good secondary a lot of the time. You know, most armies are going to be able to get a pretty good score on that, but there are things you can do to sort of mitigate giving them, you know, a big score on Shock Tactics. Um, and then Oath is okay, but Oath isn't a 15. Um, and then some of the chapter-specific Marine armies have some, you know, some good secondaries. Some have worse secondaries than them. So, like, I feel like if you have enough units to trade with them, and to kill them down and to play the primary game, a lot of the time, if you've got good secondaries, you'll be able to win the game through secondaries. You know, just try and match them on primary, trade with their units, get them off objectives, have lots of different things that have, you know, profiles that are good enough to kill infiltrator units, terminator units, whatever it might be, just those like generic marine profiles. I think if you can manage to go even on primary with them, uh, a lot of the time you just win the game on secondaries. Yeah, I, I genuinely agree. Marines largely still have the scoring problem. They, they, didn't, they got a little better, uh, depending on your chapter. But it mostly, is they're slow, for them and they don't have baked in secondaries that let you sit there and just win. They still have to be proactive. The onus is always on them to figure out how to win the game. And that means that the way that they're going to take a lot of casualties trying to figure out how to win the game. So if you can kill them hyper-efficiently, like you were saying, just build that profile into your list to kill them really well, 
they will kind of crumble. Uh, but then this kind of brings us back to what you said in the very beginning of this Marine dialogue, which is the way to beat shooting Marines is how to beat all tanks. And the way to beat fighting Marines is how to beat all space Marine infantry. And two pretty different profiles that you're trying to attack here. Yeah, uh, you're absolutely right. And look, it's, it's going to be tough, right? It's going to be tough to come up with a list that does really well into both of those things because they're just very different. You know, Iron Hands is almost a, a totally different army to, you know, to Blood Angels, even if they run a bunch of the same units. Well, you know, ultimately, just... that, that's what you and I are trying to going to be doing in the part two of this episode where you're a demon player at heart and I, I'm supposed to be, but I've been I'm flirting with Elder. I'm not going to lie. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh I want to definitely take our ideas and kind of map them out versus the game as we perceive it and try to figure out how to build our list for LVO and what it can do. Um, What other changes, I guess, and what other elements of the meta do you think we should factor in here? And I'm looking at the armies we haven't really talked about or mentioned. So one thing, which I'm not sure how how they change is like Thousand Sons, right? They lost Armor of Contempt. Big deal. They lost Wrath of Magnus. Huge deal, because that was like one of their big passive secondary advantages. And they they took another nerf. I don't remember what it was. Do you remember what it was? Uh, you're probably just thinking of the fact that flamers are bad or are, are worse. That's what it was. Flamers, flamers, flamers don't just go in that list. Yeah, flamers yeah. got worse. So like Thousand Suns and Tyranids, two of the top contenders in my mind going into LVO, both got knocked down a peg. Do do you are you considering them at all? Uh, so I, I don't think Tyranids are really playable. At the top level now, I, ju- I just think there are too many nerfs that have compounded here, and they already struggled to score. Um, they already had you know a pretty weak secondary game. And I just think the fact now is they can't bully the primary as well as they could before. They can't move block with things like spore mines unless you want to allocate like literally some games you need to allocate two hundred points of reinforcements to spore mines. If you look at how many are getting you know generated by biovores, it's ridiculous. Um, the Flying Hive Tyrant is just so much worse because he can't overrun, right? Like, I, I think that army is just kind of, it's kind of dead the way we know it. The way that, you know, the way that John's been playing it, the way that most competitive Marine and uh, Tyranian players have been playing it, like, I think that army is kind of dead. Now, there's definitely still some stuff you can do with that faction. There are, you know, things like Hormagaunts have gone up in stock quite a lot because they kill things now and they consolidate and get on objectives. And they move a long way and they just, they do some cool things. But the the, the, the Tyranian list we know is is dead. Um Thousand Suns are really interesting because they use the LVO terrain quite well. I think they get to have guys in cover, so they get to have one plus saves and ignore, sorry, and re- increase uh, all, all his dust. Sorry, so they get the plus one save against damage one weapon. So they're still very durable. Um, I think they don't have the killing power without the flamers to actually chew through these marine lists. And all it takes is one of those Thunder Hammer Storm Shield units to get into those uh, those Scarab Occult Terminators, and they're just dead. Like yeah, sure. you can run like yeah you know, again there are plenty of lists I've seen that have got like thirty Thunder Hammer Storm Shield Terminators because they're cheap and they just deep strike them and roll charges and one unit gets in and you're going to lose most of those uh most of those Terminators um so yeah I I really think that Thousand Suns will struggle as well I think that their secondary game was kind of what was keeping them you know as strong as they were um and. Look, it hasn't gotten tremendously worse. Like it, it's not like it's you know it's not like it's as bad as you know, as bad as Tyranids or, or Marines. Like their secondary game is still better than those factions, but they don't also have the killing power to accompany them that to like to make it a truly top tier faction. I, I would agree with that. I think Thousand Suns really shined in the fact that they the the armies in the game and prior to this Armor of Contempt thing really didn't do a good job of killing them and then also stopping them from scoring. And I think now space Marines can just take a massive dudes run straight at them. They won't kill at all. And then something will get through. And that's not yeah. great for them. No, um, I, I, I think so too. I think you can only smite so many things, especially when the Marine bodies are so cheap. Um, I just think you, you just don't quite get through. They get, they get into you and then you, you're kind of dead once they get into you. Let's go back to the elf factions for a second. You mentioned in the beginning of this segment that the Harlequins weren't really on your radar. You think that the essentially the armor of cont- the the minus one invul army wide changes is, is like too much for me. I will say they got their their really awesome death jester back, who explodes sixes with luck, luck and god, and then they also got the old veil of illusion. I believe it's called the six inch aura of minus six inch range. That's back for an, an aura ability. So you you do have durability in different forms again. Yeah, so, so you, you do. That, that's that, that's definitely true, right? Um, I it feels to me like that's just the the minus one involved there is is such a problem when it comes to keeping stuff 
alive. I think that those durability changes help and the death jester, like it obviously helps, right? But I'm just not sure that you can you, you can survive enough. I, I already felt like, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of armies could just kill through the Harlequins and, you know, do enough damage that it sort of, you know, they, they couldn't hit them back. And I, I don't know, like maybe I'm wrong. I said I haven't played with it. I haven't played against it. I haven't really done the math here. Um, I just feel like the five plus save is, um, you know, on, on 90% of the army is just a little bit too weak to keep them alive. In, in a meta where a contemptor, sorry, a contemptor, a, um, a gladiator reaper is 150 points and shoots almost 40 shots. You know, I, I just can't see Harlequin staying alive um, when there's stuff like that running around. Yeah, I definitely think the Space Brain shooty version will just ha- has the risk of mathing them straight off the table. The If you look at Harlequins, not what they lost, but what they gained is armor contempt going away just makes their AP2 super deadly in general. And now they functionally hit harder. They can in theory, kind of transition more to a mission play style army in my mind, where they just make these surgical trade with units onto objectives, steal primary, rock their secondaries, and call it a day, get tabled while you're doing it. But I'll admit, that's a much harder game to play than just playing Harlequins in the traditional sense. I think in the hands of a really experienced Harlequin general, they can play a really janky, cagey, mission-y style army and give anybody a run for their money. But as an army archetype, I think it's going to be really hard to pull off. Yeah, I also think that um, the units that can take free storm shields in Space Marines, like I said, as well as the the Terminators, I just think units that get that get a storm shield for free, they kind of don't lose armor of contempt, right? Because they get the plus one to saving throws back there anyway. Uh, and I think Harlequins will really struggle with armies that have a lot of storm shields running around, where the AP one, you know, an AP two kind of gets neutered a little bit. Um, but I agree with yet. So I, I think that people have been playing Harlequins for a long time and have a lot of reps on that army, a lot of experience, and kind of know the matchups. The faction I don't think is dead for those players. I just think it's dead for me when I haven't played uh, a game with Harlequins in six months or something like that. You know, it's, I don't uh, think it's anyone looked at these changes and was like, "I'm going to start playing Harlequins for LVL." Yeah, that, that's it. Right. I think that's probably more what I was trying to get at rather than the faction. I, I don't think the faction is dead the way that Nids are dead. I think if you play Harlequins, you still have a lot of your old. Yeah, you know, a lot of your tricks and a lot of your potential to score points and, and do well that way. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't be picking them up personally uh, if I wasn't already a Harlequin player. So talk to me about Jukari. I know they're an army that you and I have both played extensively. And like you said, armor contempt, big problemo. Another thing that I also will highlight is you can just now insert a Harlequin patrol for free. So what I want to do with that is just insert like two Shadow Seers or even just one in like five troops, call it a day just to get Psychic Ritual or, or Psychic Interrogation into my faction. What do you think of all that? Yeah, it, it's not bad. I've written a few lists and I've been playing around with it. I actually think the bigger change is the Tantalus. I actually think the Tantalus is good now. Do you know um, I took three Tantalus to ATC, right? I, I do, and I was okay. actually... There was a point in time where I was considering calling you up and saying, hey, man, I kind of want your, your Tantalus for LVO because I don't really want to fly. <laughs> I don't really want to fly want... 16 hours with three Tantalus. Matt, they, I've had like three people do it. If you want it, they're yours. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't. I don't. I, I, I thought they were better than they are. They, 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 they're good. Like, don't get That's me wrong. That's the trap. I, That's the Tantalus trap. They either thought they were better than they are. I, I can tell you, 20 points down doesn't change the fact they're dying in your deployment zone. Turn one. 30 down, Nick. They are 220. They went from 300 to 250 to 220. They are the cost of two Raiders, and they're very good. I've, I, I've, I've put the models on the board, and I've like rolled some dice, and I've had a look. They're very good into a, a meta where there's a lot of Marines, man. Think about that shooting into a meta with a bunch of Marines. Think about loading those Tantaluses up with some ignore cover racks with liquefier guns. This is like, exactly what I did. I did this to uh, people. All, all yeah. I'm thinking of is a contemptor shooting a Tantalus turn one in my deployment zone because I can't hide it. And then I have an army of racks walking around in my deployment zone. Because that just also go, happens to me first. quite a few just times. Go first. Just go first. I will say I played against Tau on, at ATC. And, you know, no one on my team wanted Tau. This is like the scariest army at the time in the meta. So I was like, all right, guys, I'll fall on the sword. You know what I did, Matt? I went first. I deployed every model on the line. I went 22 inches straight at him, tabled him by turn two. Yeah. Don't they go They go 28 in charge, don't they? they, yeah, they whatever it was. They're super yeah, fast. Yeah. yeah. And and if they die, just just roll the six. Just blow up, just kill things. So I, I, I genuinely think that one Tantalus is good. My I favorite think- play is the emergency disembark, because then you're yeah. just everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I wrote a list that had one and it had a couple of different options of what you put in it. But 
you know, I think the options were basically you can put like 10 incubi at a tax unit of Cabalites and like um, and Drizar or something in there and just fly it up to the middle of the board. If they kill it, you emergency disembark behind a wall, then you go kill things on turn two. Um, that was kind of like the idea. Then I also had a list that had a bunch of racks in it. So you could like do the same thing with with racks and like emergency disembark obsec onto like multiple places and deny primary and get in like essentially an auto 12 on on turn two if they kill it. Um, so, like, I really like the Tantalus. I think Tantalus is really good. I spoke a lot about the Tantalus on Adam's podcast as well. If everyone can tell, I'm, I'm hype. I really it's like Tantalus time. Tantalus. It's always Tantalus time. T- Tanny time, mate. Uh, I, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's the LVO winning list. I don't think we're going to see, you know, three Tantaluses on, on top table, you know, round eight. Um, but it's pretty cool. Now, other changes, look, racks went up a point. Um, that kind of sucks. I don't think they are a problem, but I guess 180 racks in this meta might be a problem. Um so not the end of the world there. Witches went down a point, which is killing efficiency went up, as I keep saying, 100% into Marines when I'm like at AP1. Are money right now. Yeah, is, yeah. yeah, witches are really good. And like I, I still love my Blood Bride unit. Um, I played, sorry, played that at WTC, and it was like the best unit in every game. I did get demolished by Jack's Tower, but he was very surprised when the Blood Brides one tap long strike, and that was, uh, that was pretty cool. Um, but... Yeah, uh, I, I think that, that witches and incubi are like really great profiles into marines. I think that the D characters like the succubus, the you know the fight twice archon and draz are all really good into marines. Um, losing triple patrol kind of sucks just in terms of the mission um, and like you know sorry, sorry in terms of the the mission pack and like the arcs of omen detachment and not being able to have your warlord be draz kind of hurts. You do get to take a um, a real space raid in the arcs of omen but you have to have an archon as your warlord which means draz can never get a warlord trait so you don't get the real hits and wounds on draz which you really want um you do get to have the real hits and wounds on the archon with the the gin blade which is still good uh but it does mean that draz hits you know, a little bit more wet noodly you know he's kind of more valuable giving his uh his aura buff to incubi at that point in time but look the DA list, you get a lot of stuff. I, I've written a few of them. You get heaps of stuff you know a big unit of racks with the homunculus lets you res models is great um, you can, you know, res models onto objectives in your command phase and get, you know, score primary points. Your opponent wasn't expecting you to score. You can do some cool things like that. You know, the homox fights are still pretty obnoxious. They still don't really die. And look, if you get the jump on Marines, you'll kill them. You know, Incubi go in on pretty much every Marine profile. You know, Blood Rides go in on Marine profiles. Even just Witches now will go and kill things. All the characters go kill things. It seems pretty good. Uh, I think the the matchup into Grey Knights is actually harder than the matchup into to vanilla space marines is with that army. Well, it always has been for Jakari. Green Knights are made of teleporting bullets and psychic powers that clear screens. It's just such a challenging match to play. Yeah, and I, I guess, I, I don't know if that's where you want to go next, but I think it's probably a good time to talk about Grey Knights because they got buffed a little bit as well. well I, um, I was actually, the Grey Knights were not on my radar, but I'm really curious to see why they're on yours. What do you think for Grey Knights? I'll, um, I'll admit I haven't read them. Uh, point, points reductions pretty much everywhere. Um, so like a strike unit's 100 points now. An interceptor unit went down 10 points. Um, what's really big, uh, I think, and look, this is potentially just because of the the great art opponent that I regularly have used to play the MSU, like Marine body list with like all the strikes and the interceptors and the pergs and the, um, the purifiers. But pergs getting free side cannons is pretty cool. It's 100 and... Like it's 115, I want to say, 115 or 110 for a perg squad with four psi cannons now. And teleport assault went to 5 VP every turn you do it. So you can That's put Drago's so chapter points. master. Yeah, yeah. Dra- Drago chapter mastering into the pergs, gate them up the board, kill a crit screen, kill a, you know, a unit of infiltrators, kill whatever it might be, five points. It's pretty good <laughs> when their secondaries are already pretty cracked. I think that I think Grey Knights have a really good secondary game. I didn't realize that. That's that's really interesting. And what a foil to where I was actually going to bring us, which is chaos. Um, I know I, you're you're going to play demons for LV, at least you're talking about it. So I definitely want to to save a lot of our demon discussion for for part two of the show before we actually build the list. But what do you think about chaos and how they fared in general? Any any variety flavor of it? Yeah. So we've already done T Suns, I guess. There's not really much to talk about with Death Guard. I think they just strictly got worse. Um, they didn't really have a problem killing before. Like they didn't have a lot of AP one, AP two. They have a lot of AP three. You know, with the you know the swords and the you know the the I guess the plague flails AP two. But like they've got a lot of high AP in that army already, and they had access to um uh the inoxorable for the extra AP contagions. Like I don't really feel like they gained a lot by armor of contempt going away. 
I think if anything, they actually they they definitely got worse in terms of they lost armor of contempt as an army. They they got two points down on plague marines. But when you actually go to build a death guard army, nobody really ran more than like fifty, sixty plague marines at most. So that's a hundred, hundred twenty in savings, which is five more plague marines instead of armor of contempt. So that's a net durability nerf. But the where I think death guard might actually shine is if you run the plague company. I think it's Mortarian's... The Angel, Heroic Indiv- Indivade the, one? The Heroic Intervention yeah. and no rerolls as their as their Warlord mm-hmm. trait. No rerolls shuts down Space Marines hard. Like That's what the army's made out of. So if you can really get that going, you might be well-placed with Death Guard in respect to the meta. Yeah, so, so the problem with that, right, is you have to get in Contagion range. So you've got to get a character all the way up there or a unit and use... Um, I forget the strategy name, the the one where you, the three CP one where you get to move a contagion onto a different unit, two CP, whatever it might be. I, I forget I forget what it's called. Um, it's been a very long time since I played Death Guard, unfortunately. Um, but you have to get that in range, and the Marine Army can kind of just walk away from you. So like they kind yeah, of just walk out out of range of the. It's no very much a counter to like the combat Marine armies that are fighting you next to you. But uh, yeah, like a shooting yeah. Marine army will just walk backwards and keep shooting you. Yeah, like it works with Mortarian because you can get the half move range in Contagion range as well, so they can't really just walk away. Um, but Mortarian isn't particularly durable. Um, so, yeah, I, I think Death Guard pretty strictly got hurt. What do you think about CSM overall? Terminators and that entire build archetype, I think, is dead. Um, Emperor's Children is, is it is it dead? It's I didn't like it in it's the dead. first place. I really didn't. I didn't I think it was that good. That. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So none of us liked it, and then it got nerfed. I mean, yeah. there are people who've been successful with it. We're talking about the ten man Terminator unit that you put Dark Apostle with the the Felon Pain and all the all the nine yards on it. But I think people can play around it in with respect to the mission really well. Like it's bad at scoring points, and it's easy to kite around. It's relatively slow, and now it's expensive. Yeah, that that look, that's true. And like a lot of people were running Abaddon even when it wasn't Black Legion. And like Abaddon went up uh, a chunk. He's three fifty now. Like he's very expensive. Um, Fabius look, Files uh, army rule got nerfed. Although I don't, I think that's not actually that big a deal. Their secondary is my favorite part about Bile. That's still intact. Yeah. Um, so I, I, yeah, Empress Children obviously got hurt as well with the points increase to the um, the Mark of Slanesh. Uh, so like I, that doesn't I make think a huge they got difference. A buff. I mean that's that's five points across you know? many units. Mm. But like the the uh, secondary is where I really like them. The adorn yeah, the canvas eclectic. That's a lot better. Is it? I, I don't know. Is it actually better? I. I uh, so here's I how know. it works. Now it's basically if it, it checks every turn, your turn, your opponent's turn. You get a point if you kill the unit in shooting. Period. So like with a bunch of blast masters, that's pretty doable. Kill a unit in combat. Well, you can do this in both turns, and you're playing chaos marines. You better be doing this. Kill a character with a character. Okay, this might not really happen. And hold more objectives than your opponent. At the end of your turn, if you're not doing that, you're not playing 40k. That's a that's a, like a not a 15, but I think it's a lot of natural points you will score without going ever out of your way at all. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll give you that. That's probably fair. You kind of just like score, you know, seven to eight by playing the game, and maybe a few more if you really you know invest into it. So that that's probably a fair call. Um, I, I I don't know. I, I don't feel like they were look. I, I didn't love the Empress Children Army before. Uh, I felt like too many things were just too good at killing Marines, and now that's even easier. Um, and I think people are going to be tech to Marines. Here's the thing, right? Like, when Empress Children were the only CSM army doing well, uh, they were, like, the only, like, Marines with that profile in the meta. Like, Thousand Suns are a bit different just because they had the combination of Armor of Contempt and All is Dust, and they were, like, a little bit harder to kill, and they played the game a little bit differently. Um, but when... The Empress Children MSU army was like was good and winning and in the meta. They were like the only power armor. Now there's all of this power armor in the meta. I think everyone's just going to be ready to kill it. I think everyone's going to come teched to kill that profile. And I think it's going to be really hard for you to play the game when you're going to go to LVO and you're going to play five armies that are just geared to you know, either take advantage of marine profiles or just kill marine profiles. I, I think you're absolutely right. I, I wasn't considering Chaos Space Marines as actually being Marines in a world where everyone's gearing up to kill Marines. That's absolutely fair. <laughs> what yeah, what I do think is good, though, is Black Legion. I actually think Black Legion is the winner here. Black um, Legion is one of my faves. Talk to me. What's good about Black Legion? Uh, 
Well, Black Legion is good because of Abaddon obviously giving his full aura, and I think Abaddon's still worth 350 in Black Legion. And I, 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 again, I also spoke about this on Adam's podcast a little bit as well, so if you like this idea, I talked about it in a bit more detail, and I think it was in part two of his podcast. Um, but Legionnaires' weapons are all free now. So you can have Legionnaire units with Mark of Corn coming you know, out of Rhinos or you know, starting on the board and getting advanced and char- sorry, not advanced and charge, getting, um, getting Abaddon's buff and like going and messing stuff up with Two free heavy weapons, two free special weapons, um, free combat weapon on the sergeant, free plasma pistol, uh, a couple of the big, um, the uh, the tainted axes. Yeah, yeah. And then, like, all uh, Astartes chainswords. At AP2, with real hits and wounds, um, you know, 195 points a unit, I think it is, with the mark. Um, I actually think those units kind of slap, and they're obsec. Um I don't know. You maybe don't need to run ten mans. Maybe you run like six or seven mans. Maybe there's like a sweet spot there. I haven't like really played it or written the list. Like maybe, maybe ten mans are too expensive. Maybe there's a a sweet spot there where you get a bunch of them, and then you still get the Terminator unit. I'm not saying that the Terminator li- list is good. Like the big Terminator brick is good, but I think it's better as Black Legion than it is as a lot of other things. I don't know. Legionnaires with free weapons seems pretty good to me as well. Legionnaires and free weapons. I actually really like Dread Claws for Legionnaires. Just being able yeah. to get that turn one tempo is so awesome. Just taking three of them and being in your opponent's face with it. Yeah, uh, definitely. So, look, again, I'm not saying that's the LVO winning list by any stretch, but I think that's that's my highlight for Chaos Space Marines, I think, is the free weapons on Legionnaires plus, like, Black Legion buffs and just sort of, like, getting plus one to hit when you're hitting the closest thing to you, getting, you know, exploding sixes, like, fighting twice because they're Legionnaires, having access to the fight twice stratagem. Um, I, I don't know. Se- seems pretty good to me. For sure. So... Before we hop on over to part two and really get into mapping out what you are personally taking to LVO and what we're considering, how it all works, what is there anything we missed? Is there any elephant in the room we haven't talked about as far as the meta in your mind? Um, I think we've gone through most of it, right? Like we haven't really talked about Admech. Admech did get some pretty significant points changes as well, uh, as well as a couple of secondary buffs. Um, I'll be honest, I don't know what Admech does. When I play an Admech player, they tell me their rules and it goes in one ear and out the other, and they roll dice, and they tell me what's happening, and I don't really know what's going on a lot of the time because all of the weapons sound the same. Um, it's like, <laughs> it's a very confusing experience for me playing against Admech, but I, I do know that... Admech Admech 10,000 times against Richard Ziegler, and I still don't know anything that <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't it's made any difference. Strange faction. <laughs> it doesn't help. Uh, but but they went down, right? They they went down pretty significantly. I'm not sure if you've had uh, heard all of the news from from Richard. I'm sure that he's pretty happy with the way Admech was treated. But their secondaries got better too. So again, I'm not sure it's enough to make them the LVO winning faction. But in the hands of someone like you know Richard, it very well may be. It's um, not a faction you pick up and play. I think if you've been a hardcore yeah. admin player, you just got buffs and you're you're even more disgusting and will take you as you come. But I think in the grand, grand scheme of admech or LVO, not many people are playing admech before. Uh, very hard bat faction to just pick up and play effectively right now. Yeah, I I definitely think that if you're going to netlist, you netlist Marines. Uh, I think if you're going to jump on the new hotness, if you want to build a new army based on these changes, it's Marines. But admech definitely have... Have, have improved. Like if you're an Admech player, you have won out of this uh, this update. You you are a winner. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for watching this episode, listening to this episode. Don't forget to like the podcast, give us a five star review, comment if you're watching this on YouTube, subscribe to the channel, all of that jazz. And it would really, really mean the world to both Matt, myself, and everyone else at the Art Award team if you could go over to our Patreon, patreon.com slash AOW40K. There's a link below. What you can do there is subscribe to part two of not only this show, but also Art of War Unbroken, or you can go to Adam Camilleri's show on Down Under as well. Part two of the show, Matt and I are going to break down what we're considering for LVO, our lists, our ideas, what factions we're going to play. Maybe I'll become a Space Marine player at the end of it. I've yellow I'd scarred before. Join us in part two. Help support the channel. It'll mean the world to us. We love producing this content for you. We want to keep on doing it. Your support means the world. Thanks so much, everyone, and we'll catch you later. Like what you just listened to? Check out Art of War Down Under and Art of War Unbroken on the competitive 40K network. The Art of War 40K.com. <laughs>